Greetings, everyone. My name is Trebby Johnson, and I am here with my co-host, Harriet Sams, and our guest today, Timothy Darville, whom Harriet will introduce soon. And we'd like to welcome you to the Earth Exchange Cafe. Timothy just disappeared. Oh. Well, hopefully he'll find his way back. <laughs> That's bizarre. Hopefully he'll find his way back. Um, we Anyway, we are hoping to welcome you to the Earth Exchange Cafe. Uh, we were three of us gathered here a moment ago, and then our, our, our eminent archaeologist suddenly vanished. So we're hoping he can find his way back. And this is the regular monthly meeting of the Earth Exchange Cafe. And even though it's on uh, internet and Zoom and techno te technologically run, we invite you to uh, settle back and really imagine that you are in a beautiful, cozy cafe with your tea, your coffee, your hot chocolate, whatever it is that you like to drink, and that you are, there, there are lots of books around, interesting magazines, perhaps there's some music playing, live music. And the people who are gathered here are interested in the things that you are interested in. So uh, we will begin our conversation as soon as we get Tim back. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and in the meantime, we just will welcome you. Yeah, we do welcome you. And uh, we welcome the, the spirit of Tim. I'm sure he's trying to, to get oh, through. Oh, there this. he is. I see him he on is. Facebook. Great. Oh, so uh, let's see if I can send him the link again. Yeah, you send him uh, the link. Yeah. And <laughs> we, we, it's quite funny because we um, we had trouble trying to communicate, to connect with him in the summertime as well. So uh, I wonder whether there's... <laughs> Here he is. We're a bit doomed to... Um... Here he is. Shall we start? Should we start again, maybe, Trebby, or what do you think? Well, I think having welcomed everybody, that's fine. Okay. And then we can and just launch Tim. into the introduction. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Can you hear us? I think you're there trying to maybe log on or get on. I wonder if you can um, find a way of um, connecting to the audio so we can talk to you. Tim, there you are. are you there? Hello. That's better. You disappeared. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. And I'm really not sure what happened there. Well, good. You're back. Okay. Yeah, so I just did a little short welcome to everybody, and we have not introduced you yet, obviously, um, because you weren't here. So uh, <laughs> we did a short introduction to the, the cafe and this hour that we're going to spend having a yeah. really interesting conversation with an interesting person. So I turn it over to Harriet to make the introductions and start us off. Yeah, well, welcome, Tim. Um, coming into the, to the cafe through the door. Um, and seating yourself with with all of these people around you, grabbing a nice hot chocolate or a coffee, um, and we are we are just so glad that you're here. So a little bit of background: Tim Darville, uh, Professor Tim Darville, OBE, is an English archaeologist and author, um, very well known um, around the research of Stonehenge um, and knows very a lot about the Stonehenge landscape. Um, and we are particularly interested in um, research that's been um, uh, that's been undertaken in the last few years with Dr. Vanessa Hayslip um, about uh, called the Human Henge, which is a project about well-being in the sacred ancient landscape, human well-being, um, and how that's how that's working. Um, and we're really, really interested in in your approach to your professional, your archaeological knowledge that you have about such an iconic landscape. Um, and so we're really interested in, in um, you explaining a little bit about what does it mean to to be going to a landscape deliberately to undertake yeah. well-being uh, practices 
Um, and how did it come about and where do you feel that your your expertise are fitting in with that um, with that approach? Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Harriet. And um, great to be in the cafe and I'm uh, enjoying my cup of cocoa. I hope <laughs> I hope this Internet connection is going to stay stable. I'm not quite sure what happened there as I came through the door, as it were. Um, anyway, Stonehenge, well-being, these are really important things. And I'd like to just unfold it a little bit in coming at it from two directions. The first direction is an archaeological one, a very archaeological one. And that is that, you know, we've got all these wonderful monuments, Stonehenge, Avebury, lots of stone circles, places that many people in the cafe perhaps are familiar with in one sense or another. Some are incredibly well known, some not so well known, but they're still important old sites. Um, and we've always had a bit of trouble in a way trying to explain what they were used for. And archaeologists always use this word ritual, ceremony, all these kind of terms get trotted out and, and we really don't know what we mean by any of them. But it seems that when you look in the ethnography and when you look in the anthropology of the same sort of early farming communities that we're talking about for these monuments, what you find is that one of their big preoccupations, of course, is the notion of healing and the notion of well-being. This is such a fundamental human emotion that it's not surprising that communities throughout time and space on our planet, ever since people you know, arrived, as it were, um, were concerned with these things. They're bound to be concerned with these things. And so they often construct monuments, they construct places, they choose sites in the landscape which are important to them. Holy Wells are a great example in, in Britain and Europe. Um, the church, of course, appropriated most of the prehistoric ones and, and, and referred to them as Holy Wells, yet actually they're sacred springs, which go back, in many cases, thousands and thousands of years. So the first thing is that when we look at a place like Stonehenge, you just think, well, wait a minute, probably one of its primary functions is going to be as some sort of healing centre. It's the prehistoric equivalent of a kind of a Delphi or something like that in more recent times. And this is, this is what happens with archaeological interpretation. So on the one hand, perhaps we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about places and just think healing is an important role. It may not be the only role, but it's an important role in how these places worked in the past. And we've done a certain amount of work to try and um, unfold that argument <clears throat> at Stonehenge, one of which is to look at the, at the so-called blue stones inside Stonehenge, which are rather special because they've been brought to Stonehenge from about 250, as far as 300 miles away in the far west of Wales. They occur out on the Priscelli Hills in West Wales and prehistoric people got these rocks, they're about four or five tons each, and brought them across to Stonehenge and set them up and constantly rearranged them. They're always messing about with them. They're always breaking them up. Um, and we did an excavation there back in 2008, and we found the debris from, from this breaking up and lots of little talismans and amulets and lucky charms and things were made from them. So we can sort of see that perhaps this healing hypothesis, as we call it, has some merit at Stonehenge and no doubt at other sites too. So that's, that's the one direction. The second is that ancient monuments in the present world, in the present day, need to perform some sort of use to us. They need to perform some sort of function. There's no point in spending large sums of public money and there's no point in making them open and accessible to the public if they're no use to us. Um, that's just a folly. So how are we using these places? What are we using these places for? And um, in a way, this comes from two directions as well. One is that over the last few decades, we've seen many of these places become magnets for people who want to reconnect with their world, reconnect with their landscape, do things on their own very often or in small groups, which provide, if you like, a, a spirituality, a sense of spirituality about the place. And that's important. But places like Stonehenge, of course, are managed and run by state agencies. And they need to recognize that these things must have a purpose as well. And so finding a good use for our ancient monuments and making that use available and accessible to people is in the, if you like, the second ingredient that came into the mixing bowl when we were thinking about this. The idea that sites, many of these sites were themselves healing places in the past, and the fact that we can make them useful today gives us a very nice opportunity. And of course, why do we need these places today? Well, every statistic that's ever been published in recent times about mental health and about well-being says that the world is, generally speaking, in a rather bad way. 
and that we need to find some solutions. And that's at a general level, at least very true. And you can take a medicalized solution, of course, but there's lots of other solutions. And, and in the last few years, people have become aware and many people now recognize that social prescribing is important, but even just self-motivated interest in places is a way of staving off some of these kind of mental health issues. And I would almost turn the argument around, you know, we've been visiting these sites for hundreds of years. People have been looking at these places for a long time. We may not have realized in a way quite what we were doing, but in going there in groups, going there in communities, enjoying these places was itself without you know, being too big about it, a way of maintaining our own mental health in good state, in a good form. And we were doing it without realizing. Now, perhaps we're a little bit more understanding of the needs and perhaps people have lost, lost touch with some of these things. We can redirect them. We can put these things back on the agenda for people to go and visit and go and have a look at. And it's remarkable that when you introduce people to these sites and just almost let them go, just, just explore it yourself, they find a sense of peace, a sense of tranquility, a sense of connectedness with the landscape, with the place, in a way which I think very few of them would have realized before. Yeah. A um, um, question, I, as, as I mentioned before we started talking, I went to Stonehenge when I was 24, 25, and uh, you, there weren't any walls around it, and you could just walk up into the middle of it. And I, and I think there's something about the men, monumentality of a site like that. And and also the like the Nazca lines in in I think it's Peru and the, mm. the mounds in the burial mounds in Ohio that that the, there's they're monumental but also there's that mystery of how how human beings could have created them. So I mean, the, my my question is it's it, that so you found all these talismans and things that people had made out of the stone. Do you have any, is there any kind of evidence or sense of how people used them for healing? I mean, was, would it, was it be only to just go there? Would there have been some kind of special ceremony? Mm. It's something we've been thinking about quite a lot because it, you know, it has to have a process behind it. And, and there's, there's several things we can say about this. One is that occasionally we find graves in the vicinity of Stonehenge which have in them pieces of stone from Stonehenge. And it looks very much like they've taken these pieces as talismans, as lucky charms, that kind of thing. And they've kept them about their person. And it's that connection between the piece of stone and the individual, which is, which is really quite powerful. But we can go a little bit further than this because ironically, back in the 12th century, there was a monk his name was Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, and he wrote a history of the kings of Britain. Now, quite a lot of what he said was, was largely made up, and of course he was working to a fairly political agenda, but he wove into the stories that he produced all sorts of folklore and tradition, which he must have got from oral traditions that had come down, or perhaps even from documents that we no longer have. That's a possibility as well. But Stonehenge is the only ancient monument that he talks about in, in what is a pretty substantial text. And he's very clear that Stonehenge was built with stones that were considered to have magical healing properties. And uh, although he weaves that round with all sorts of stories about the magician Merlin and all sorts of other people um, who get involved in that, in a sense, the, the grain of truth which comes through is this belief that these stones had this, this kind of purpose. He talks about it quite a lot, and he actually explains how it works. And what happens is that you make a pool of water and you put bits of the stone in the water, or you put the water against the stone, whichever. Um, so you make these little pools and you bathe in them, and that's what caused the healing, which mm -hmm. is exactly what holy wells and sacred springs and all these kind of things are often about. And, and ironically, when you go back to Wales and you look on the Preseli Hills where these stones originally came from, you find that many little streams and rivers coming off the hills, just around the spring heads, have got dams across the watercourse, which blocks it back and just creates a little pool, which the spring is feeding. Now, how old some of those are, 
it's totally impossible to say because they're still there and in all honesty people still go and use them mm -hmm. um, and you find recent graffiti sometimes on the on the stones or just by the stones so they're still they're still part of the lifestyle if you like of of the hills but these things go back into prehistory and, and the fact they come from just around where these stones come from when they were taken down to Stonehenge just makes all these connections so yeah. yeah there's a few loose ends one has to accept but there's also a very strong tradition that comes through that this is what it's all about that's very interesting um and uh, just reading some of the comments um somebody's actually mentioned that going to the quarry itself in Priscelli um, was idyllic there was the, the quality of something in the stones in the in the location and just um i know that you've mentioned it before about the sentience of place the sentience and animism of the stones um and so thanks for expanding that when you actually are in Stonehenge now, so fast forward to this present day, um, and the academic uh, meets that person who re who has this intuition or this uh, this feeling that all of these threads are coming together. How how does that then sit um, with um, offering both your academic knowledge, but also that that sense of the, the stones are guiding you in your own way. Um, and how mm. do you how do you reflect that to to participants, perhaps? There's a lot of there's a lot of things bundled up there, Harriet, um, which we can explore a little bit. Uh, let's start. Oh, can you still hear us, Tim? You've um. You've frozen. Um, we've lost your video, just as you were going to answer a very interesting question. Um, are you are you still there? Being recorded. Oops, I'm still here. Okay, great. Your your video's gone off, but if you want to leave yeah, it off, no, there we are. Broadband um, that bandwidth, that's fine. Um, that's okay. I think we're okay still. Not sure why that went flaky. Um, where will we? This, yeah, this so, kind of positivist enlightenment view of the world in which there's a kind of right and wrong and a sort of a notion that people are better than animals and that the world around us is a natural world and so on. It's very strong. It, it comes through very strongly in the way that we, we tend to navigate the world. But take one step away from it and think back into the way that perhaps prehistoric people thought about their world. And we see some completely different ways of looking. Um, and I'm increasingly interested in trying to think back how prehistoric people would have seen their world and how they would have appreciated it and understand it because it might just help us a little bit and one of the areas that that comes across quite strongly is the notion of animism and the idea that everything actually has a spirit everything actually has some purpose and some relationship with each other and that in many ways everything is equal in the world in terms of how we are and how we relate to it. This is not that far back, of course. You only have to look at Roman religion to see that the spirits of the earth, the spirits of the sky, the spirits of the rocks and so on are all reflected in the local deities and in the local way that they do it. They even call it the sort of um, you know, the genius of place, genius loci, the quality of the place, the spirit of the place. Um, so we're not talking tens of thousands of years ago. We're only talking of a couple of thousand years ago, and this was still booming. So let's just allow ourselves, perhaps, to go back into some of those ways of thinking about the world. And I'm sure perhaps some of those in the cafe here today have put their back against a stone or put their arms around a stone or a tree or a plant or something like this in the world and have had a sense that there's something in there, that there's something that our bodies can communicate with that other material. And as soon as we just allow ourselves to accept that some of those other materials have got some sort of agency in terms of how the world works, then we can go into a wholly different place. And perhaps this is the starting point for thinking about why ancient monuments are important, but they don't have to be formal monuments. Landscapes have much the same effect and places that people have, have made special for one reason or another in the past can also work terribly well. I think people do have a sense that some places are more special than others. I'm not quite sure how that how that works, but I think in one's own consciousness of moving around the landscape, there are certain places which seem to attract you. 
seem to make you feel more comfortable, more at home. And it's very hard to put your finger on why that should be. But if you go for a walk, you know, five, 10 miles or so, there will be some places in that walk which just stand out in one's mind and, and perhaps come back to you after the walk and in later times. So there's something going on here. There's some, some sort of emotional attachment between us as people and the world in which we live and the animacy of that world, I think, is potentially quite important. So when we go out in, into and, and take groups of people for a sort of cultural therapy kind of program, what we're really doing is trying to find ways of connecting folk and ourselves with that other world, with that landscape, with that place. And that creates a space, I suppose you might almost say. It's probably as we get a bit stuck for jargon at a certain point, but it creates a space in which one can do things, one can work, one can relax one's mind, one can go and explore other worlds, worlds of memory, worlds of the past, and we can conjure up ideas. And so far as mental health goes, I think one of the important things is the way that we use memory and the way that we use imagination because those are things which make our brain function in slightly different ways um there's lots of things which are great for great therapy for, for the body and the mind um but when you can exercise memory and you can exercise imagination and together they can be very powerful things going on inside one's head and i think that's one of the areas that that is useful Mm. that's that's so interesting and, and there's a couple of threads that i'd like to pick up on one the first one um is is it almost sounds like your when you said when we go for a walk there are maybe a few places three or four places that we just feel something there's something more of itself perhaps there's a, mm. a, a sense of genius loci um and, and our charity of course is is works with what we would call wounded landscapes, but yet also un, almost unfailingly, the people who attend to those so-called wounded landscapes, the places that we would th feel like we should reject, have got a very strong sense mm -hmm. that actually comes in many ways as a healing uh, relationship. Um, and so I'm really interested in what you're saying about there's something underneath what we would call it as sacred because Stonehenge has been messed around with quite a lot. It's, it's fallen, it's been erected, there's concrete, there's all sorts of different woundings for want of a better phrase. You know, it used to have a big road going right through that, that henge. Now that's yeah. a bit further away. And of course that's, that's perhaps a wounding in many, many ways as well. So I'm really interested in, in that maybe we should just talk a little bit about about that and in, in your understanding of um uh whether we've got the word wounded place maybe a little bit um you know it's not quite the right phrase to it's describe an interesting it. concept it's an interesting concept harriet um i'm not sure it's quite the right word but as i said before we, we do find ourselves a bit lost for jargon sometimes when we're talking about these ideas so we have to be a bit careful we don't press words you know, beyond their, their immediate purpose. Um, but of course, every landscape changes. The world is a place of change. We change as individuals, we change as humans, we change as, as and the world is changing naturally and physically around us in all sorts of different ways. And we're part of that change. Some of it we implement and some we don't. Um, some of it we adapt to and some of it we fight against. Um, and the wounding idea is an interesting one because we're quite, adept I'm afraid to say at wounding each other as well in all sorts of different ways and we bounce back we adapt we change we you know we become different people perhaps um and so I I would see the concept of wounding as more a concept of interaction and change some of which is negative and perhaps wounding is the negative aspect of that but it doesn't mean to say that it's it doesn't mean to say it's bad, I suppose, you'd have to, you'd have to recognise, but it's not long-term bad, as it were. There are things that can be done to, to heal the wounds, to make them at least less hurtful. And as you say, Stonehenge mm -hmm. is a case in point, which has suffered quite badly over the years, and, and one might argue even at the moment, there used to be two roads one each side of Stonehenge. The A344 is what's called to the north of Stonehenge. And that used to actually clip the edge of the stone circle, clip the edge of the monument. 
And of course, lorries and buses and ambulances and cars and everything else went along that road. It was a pretty busy road. It's an A-class road, so it's it was not insignificant, the traffic that it had. And it was quite a dangerous road because it had access into the car park for Stonehenge. And as I suspect many people in the cafe know that the people who visit Stonehenge, especially those who, who get a higher car and go there, are not always most familiar with British traffic, let's just say. Um, and it's easy to see how it happens that people went there, had a very nice time there, had their cup of coffee and the ice cream and saw a fantastic monument and got back in the car and just reverted to their natural way of driving, which is on the other side of the road. And that's not a good place to be <laughs> in a busy traffic system. And there were, I'm afraid, some accidents. There were one or two fatalities in that area. Um, and so removing the road by Stonehenge uh, was, I think, seen by many as a good thing. Um, most people, I think, saw it as a good thing. It's happened. It happened more than a decade ago now. And it's a beautifully peaceful, tranquil part of the landscape. That road's completely gone. You can just make it out and a little bit of it's still used to, to provide visitor access, but the basic road, the through road is gone as a private area now. The other road is to the south, much more controversial. It's the A303, which is one of the big trunk roads that leads from London down to the West Country. It's an incredibly busy road for most of its, most of its route. It's either a motorway or a big scale dual carriageway. Um, and it does carry an awful lot of traffic. And I don't think a week goes by without there being traffic reports on the radio of holdups at Stonehenge and accidents at Stonehenge and, and so on and so on. It's not a pretty place to be on the road, but that's from the driver's point of view, I suppose you might say. From the point of view of the people in the landscape, it's almost worse because it's noisy. It's incredibly noisy. It's smelly. You can smell the road. That's how it is. At night, the light pollution is not insignificant. And you see the flashing of the, you know, the yellowy white lights as they're coming towards you and the red tail lights as they're driving away from you. And even half a mile or so back from Stonehenge, you can still see and hear that road. I was there just last Friday with a group of people and, and we were best part of a mile to the north of Stonehenge and we could hear the road all the time. It was just, just impacting on our consciousness the whole time. And everybody in the group agreed it was high time that we got rid of this road. And there is a proposal to put it in a tunnel about three kilometers or so long, well to the south of Stonehenge. It doesn't go under Stonehenge, as some people think. It's well to the south of Stonehenge. It's broadly speaking on the line of the existing road, a little bit to the south of it, um, and it'll take the road out of the landscape. There's lots of people who don't think this should be done, and one respects their opinion on that. But I think as somebody who's spent a lifetime trying to get Stonehenge to be a better place and a more understood place, for me at least, getting that road out of the landscape is an absolute priority. And I think we have to see the project not as a new road scheme, but actually as a road, as a scheme to take a road away. It's not building a road, it's removing a road. And to do that means putting it in a tunnel. At the moment, as far as we can see, the government is prepared to spend the money and it's not an insignificant sum of money to do that. And my own hope is that we can get on with it as soon as we possibly can. Um, and, and it'll make Stonehenge so much better place. We only have to just think back to the improvements that arose as a result of removing the A344 to realize that if we remove the 303 as well, those improvements are going to be multiplied many times over. And you and I and everybody else will be able to you know, move about the landscape much more comfortably. But more importantly, I think we'll be able to enjoy Stonehenge and the monuments around it in a much more comfortable, some people say more authentic. It's not authentic. It's a 21st century landscape, but it's a landscape which isn't buffeted by really intrusive mm -hmm. things like roads. I think it's such an interesting, just completely set, set, setting apart the the real emotional impact of of people loving and being so belonging to the Stonehenge landscape and and all of the the the, the sort of arguments, but to just set, set set that aside and to to see that as an example of how any landscape that we cherish. That is wounded or is 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 su suffering. Um, how we stay in relationship to it, um, much like when a a family member is ill, you don't turn your back on them. You don't go, well, you you're 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 somehow in a in a, a way that we don't like. So I'm not going to 
love you anymore. You actually say, I still, I still am here for you. And I suppose something as long, long, long lived as the Stonehenge landscape um, gives a, a much more longer sense of stewardship and, you know, responsibility. Um, but I, I'm, I'm just going back to one of the things that you mentioned before about memory and imagination being really important. If, if that third, that, that, that the triangle, you know, if the third bring comes in, which is how is the landscape it's, itself, how is the site itself helping the individual with memory and imagination? If, if we, if it's not just how, what can I uh, get out of it, but what is the, what's, what's really there once the veil is sort of dissolved and I'm really present to this landscape, um, you know, when when a landscape is contested or it's it's challenged but also pristine and beautiful have you noticed or is uh, is a part of your work that's about bringing uh that sight animism as you were describing that that sense of sentience into the human experience oh Uh-oh. Are you are you still there? This is a fascinating conversation, but uh, obviously we've got slight internet problems. But uh, hopefully Tim heard that. Um, we can't hear you, Tim. So we'll just keep talking in, until you. Hi, can you hear us? Um, are you still there, Tim? Right. there was a message that he was connecting to audio yeah so i wonder if it's just warming up thanks for your patience yeah i'm really curious too to ask tim about his personal experience mm. with all those many decades working at stonehenge mm. yeah Can you hear us, Tim? I don't think he can. And you know, you're, until while he gets back, I'll just remark that you know your your question that you just asked Harriet, which is it, it reminds me how, as you say, people did not stop going to Stonehenge when the uh, when the roads were there. They kept going and they were annoyed and they felt, you know, they felt saddened by it or angry about it, but they didn't stop going. Mm. Mm. That's it. It's almost like it has a magic, whether it's the pristine version of itself that we would we would like to imagine. Yeah. Or whether it's just the way it is, you know, with the with the road, with the with the, you know, the bits that um, may be challenging, that the long walk might be off-putting off for some people or getting into a, into a minibus nowadays with COVID and all these kind of concerns. Um, welcome back, Tim. It's all right. Welcome I back. don't know where that there went. Two of you. <laughs> well, you've been yeah. transported to Stonehenge. So. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> yeah, we're at Stonehenge. Did you hear Stonehenge. Harriet's question? Uh, I only heard the first part, I'm afraid. We just need to recap it a little bit. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I... Um, memory and imagination of the you know the, the individual um how does that sentience of place those stones that actual mm -hmm. animism of the site itself but sort of bear uh bear bear into or or be a, a, an important relational aspect of why you take someone to that site can't you just do that yeah i suppose you know, part of the problem is i mean stonehenge is one of those things that you know everybody knows about and nobody knows about um there's so much to say about Stonehenge, but it's still so much still to know about Stonehenge. So people go there with those open questions and they go there with those thoughts of maybe by visiting it, I'll crack it. But equally, they sometimes go there and many people go there with not a lot of pre-knowledge about Stonehenge. They just know of its existence. They know it's important. They know it's interesting. But they go there wanting to find out more, I suppose, and wanting to immerse themselves in that landscape. And at the solstices, of course, English heritage throw it open for people to come. And, and at the summer solstice, if it's a, a weekend solstice when lots of people are available to come, then it can be 10,000 people there. Um, if it's a winter solstice and it's a bit wet and during the week and so on, there's 
rather less, perhaps a couple of thousand um, will come there. But nonetheless, those events which are recognised in the plan of Stonehenge do attract people and do bring people in. Is it the stone which matters? Well, strangely, one of the one of the most popular things down at the visitor centre are the so-called touchstones, where they've got a big sarsen stone, which are the equivalent of the big blocks that we see at Stonehenge, and also a block of blue stone, which are the smaller stones. They're about the same size down at the visitor centre, but you can put your arms around them um, and feel them and touch them. And they are one of the most popular things down there. And most people who go through that centre either look at or actually go and touch and um, feel, the, feel the stones. That's they've got fascinating. Them. That's their purpose, yeah. That's what yeah, they're there for. Because if you go to Stonehenge, you want to touch the stones. Um, of course, at Avebury, you're not restricted. You can walk around and you can go up and stand next to or even hug the stones. I'm not sure you're supposed to do too much to them and climb on them and so on, but um, that's not good. But you can certainly touch them and nobody's going to stop you doing that. And so there's a sort of different approach. And if you go to most other stone circles, you can sit against them or, or touch them or hug them or whatever it is you want to do there. Stonehenge is a little bit anomalous in terms of the controls over people's general access to it. But of course, with a million or more people a year going to see it, it's not surprising that there has to be a few rules in that regard. Um, but if you go at the winter solstice or at the summer solstice, it's open, it's free, you can go inside and you can put your back against the stones and you can feel the power of those stones and I think that's you know that takes us on to a point which is probably at the center of your thinking there Harriet and that is the power of place it may be a stone circle but it may other maybe other kinds of landscape too could be a spring could be a river could be a waterfall so many so many things have got power to them which we can recognize um, and archaeologically speaking of course what we're interested in is why prehistoric people or earlier populations what did they see in the landscape and why did they take those places out as being significant as well? So there's you know, questions which run in both directions. Why are we doing it today? And how did people do it in the past as well? That's, that's quite important. So power of place is fundamental, absolutely fundamental. Tim, I'm just curious about your own personal history um, with, well, with Stonehenge in particular, since that's really the main subject of our conversation today. So. It's been decades since you first came there. And I'm and I love would love to know what your first like what your emotional response was when you first started working there and has that changed at all over all these years? Yeah, it's an interesting one because of course I went there first, you know, as a visitor like everybody else. I was a child at the time and um went there and had a look around and you know, we paid our money, we went in, we bought our souvenirs and had our ice creams like everybody else. And it, it was great to see it. And we went, I think, to Avebury much the same day and, and saw a few other sites. Um but it wasn't until I'd already been a student of archaeology as I got involved in working at Stonehenge. We visited it as a student as well and um, had some very happy memories of having a look around with, for example, Colin Renfrew, who was obviously an expert in Stonehenge at the time when he was a lecturer as well. Um, so it was great to see it in the company of some of those people. But it was after that that I first got involved in um, really research on the monument itself. And it came from not a sense of archaeological research, but a sense of wanting to do something about the site itself. And this was 1983, when the idea of um, changing the visitor centre and getting rid of the roads and all that sort of thing first came to the fore. And they put together a group of people. And I was actually part of a consultancy team that was brought in by English Heritage to start working on the project. So I came in very much from the outside to do this. And suddenly we, we came to realise that there was a lot more to it than just messing about with the visitor centre and, and doing some fixes. To the visitor experience that it was a bigger problem mm. well, that bigger and, um, problem involved um, the with that, just wondering um you know when having that in intricate academic but also personal relationship what do the stones mean to you like when there's been challenges when this this that site hasn't just been a healing place it's been a, a labor of love How, what kinds of of healing um, experiences, perhaps, that you have taken support from and sucker from that have you ever experienced? Yeah, in, in quite a few fronts, actually. I mean, 
as a place which leads you to think about prehistory. I've never come across anywhere more powerful. It's not to say there aren't such places, but I've never, never found them yet. Maybe, maybe there are to be found. But when you go there, if you go there asking questions in your mind about prehistory, it seems to be one of those places which ferments good ideas and ferments ideas. And perhaps that's why a lot of people go, because they're trying to understand something about prehistory. And Stonehenge leads them, leads them to think about those things. But then there's the there's the more emotional, personal side of it, I suppose you would say. And I think the fact that you can walk in that landscape, you'd like to say in the shoes of prehistoric people, but I, I'm a realist. I think it's a, that's an idea, which is a nice idea, but we're not because we can't think quite like they did and move in the same sort of ways. But you can at least use it as an opportunity to create some space in which you can explore a landscape easily, um, comfortably, and without, um, you know, without too many controls on what you do. And to my mind, the beauty of it is not being at Stonehenge itself, but it's seeing it across the landscape and then moving towards it. One of the things we did last week was to come up to Stonehenge along the avenue, which is the ceremonial route that brought people to the to the site in prehistoric times. Well, you can walk the, the last bit of that, last mile or so of that, quite easily, and it's a great thing to do. And you see Stonehenge coming into you into view in quite a different way than the way you see it if you come in the bus or come along the, the road to it now. And that, I think, is quite powerful. But I think... When you go to look at these landscapes, a lot of it is about taking some time and taking some uh, some energy in a way to experience them properly. It's the, I suppose, a curse of the modern world that we try and do too much too quickly. And I've, I'm as guilty as this. You take um, you take a party of people around Stonehenge and you want to be in and out in two or three hours and you want them to see as many of the sites as you can. And, and so you're rushing about and, and pointing hither and thither and saying this is this age and that's that age. And, and it's all very interesting, but it doesn't actually do much for you. The opportunities that I've had over the years to actually sit on a barrow, to be inside Stonehenge, not just for a, a few minutes, but for, a, you know, in some cases, half a day, um, makes you see these things rather differently, makes you feel these things rather differently. And perhaps that's why a lot of people find ancient monuments good places to visit, not just for a quick look round, but as a place to sit. And I've been to many, many monuments and you go and visit and there's somebody sitting in it. And you know, after a while you perhaps get strike up a conversation and you ask them, and maybe they've been sitting there for an hour or two hours or three hours, maybe they've just lost track of time entirely. It doesn't matter. They're there because they can connect. There's, there's a route, if you like, there into the ground, into the place, into the space, into the landscape. And it just allows them to escape a little bit from their own world, whatever that world is, and think about their place, think about well, what they're thinking about. I don't know. I can't say any in the conversations we've had, but um, you can tell that they are releasing themselves from their present life, present world into some other place. And I think ancient monuments allow us to do that in quite a good, quite a controlled, quite an experiential sort of way. And that's and really what a lot of people are finding. It, it's, it really does say so much because we think of ourselves as living, and we do live in this very, very secular <clears throat> world. But the fact that, that 10,000 people would come to Stonehenge on the summer solstice and that people keep coming and that you would keep finding people sitting in these stone monuments it's like there really is something in the human being that is searching for mystery, that's searching for a connection with the past and 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 with with the with the drive that led people in prehistoric times to create these amazing things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's this there's this longing to know that mystery and to get closer to it we can't ever solve the mystery probably but we can come closer to it in some way whoops we've had another we've had another freeze i think <laughs> i love that just just while tim's um tim's are off um there's a stone circle near where i live um and it's very broken down it's got large 
trees plantation over it um and they're toppling and when they topple the stones are being moved and it's just really not being looked after and um i used to walk the dogs there just just myself um on my own and um and it was i i did uh, one of my first uh, global earth exchanges actually there because i decided to take a group of people oh he's gone and um and it was almost like the site itself just embraced the community it wanted lots and lots of people to be there and it was almost like the site was placed there let's say thousands of years ago um because it served a purpose for that community um and, and maybe for so long it hasn't had community nobody would go there it just had a large plantation over it and the odd dog walker but then all of a sudden having a group of a community of some sort even just for a few hours who were there were pottering around were meandering was very very powerful for that place um and yeah i i just feel that th there is a sense of that mystery being in that genius loci definitely so it somehow encourages us to go there over and over again um and yeah it's very powerful seems yeah that was some one never mind yeah well hopefully he'll get back um what i learned when i was writing about the Diné and or navajo navajo and hopi um in the late 80s and early 90s was that these places you know people don't choose sacred places the places indicate that they are special for very many reasons like there's been some kind of an event that happened there that was mysterious or there was a connection with a human being and then what's so important is that the place is that that sacredness be kept up yeah. you know that it not be says so, it's 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 not just put there and then left alone it's like almost like like keeping your house tidy and neat mm -hmm. you know that that you have to make offerings and you have to uh, teach your children about the sacredness of the place. Absolutely, there, there I, I want. To, yeah, great. Oh, that's that's a good, maybe a good question to 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 finish on. I think, uh, or or a reflection. Tim, hi, welcome We're back. Back again. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, why? No idea why we keep dropping off. The now you're transported off. back to your office again, yeah. back from Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you're still in the cafe. You're still in the, the cafe. cafe. Yeah, the yeah. cafe is still here. At, uh, yeah. The well, we've just we've got before. a we've got a we've got a sort of a, a final thought um, that we maybe expand upon. Um, that I was just while you were away, I was talking about a a, a, a very very. Um, uh, degraded stone circle near where I live that when I brought some uh, a group of people it was about eight of us to, to do a, a global earth exchange there it absolutely you could tell that the site was glad to have a group of people there and um, and then Trebi was saying about how in non-British non-European um, living um, cultures um, there's still a very clear uh, um, a tradition uh, and wisdom of the site telling the community where mm. is safe and, and I think maybe we can just close with that. Where, where, what is it in in the British archaeological identity that is 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 lost? And how much of what you're doing is essentially trying to bring back something, um, or is that just you know a, a reconstructive illusion? Um, are we essentially talking about um, bringing back a sense of of connection that is ancestral, that is a wisdom that is much much older than our modern cultures i think we can do we can do both of those things in a sense area i think on the one hand we can promote a more animistic view of the world and i personally believe that would be a better way for a lot of people to see the world and think about the world and perhaps it opens up some new channels for them to understand the world but even if if people are not prepared to do that just using the challenges of memory, using the challenges of imagination that ancient sites present to us is itself a worthwhile intellectual process. And I think that process is what helps a lot of people with their general mental health well-being. Um, and it's not about trying to be intellectual about it. It's a, it's a process through which the brain makes new connections. And if you can create these kind of new synaptic links in the brain, then you can overcome all sorts of things. It's the same thing, you know, physical exercise. 
to be fit, you need to do a certain amount of exercise. To keep your brain fit, you need to do a certain amount of exercise. And finding good ways of doing that, which are suitable and appropriate to different groups of people, is just really important. And I think, personally, that ancient monuments and the heritage that we've got, and they don't have to be that ancient, but ancient places, let's say, um, do provide that sort of mental stimulus that people need. And they can appreciate that they may not know that they're appreciating it but they are appreciating it sometimes it impinges upon their consciousness in a way they perhaps didn't expect and it's powerful it's very powerful and it, it does help people yeah and and that find that last point trevi said um just when you weren't there um about uh when a site tells you that it really matters because there's a reciprocity, that it matters for its own being. Stonehenge matters mm. because it's Stonehenge, but it, it's, it, it matters because there's an ongoing relationship with the humans who then care for it, tend it, it develop yeah. it, in, you know, and see it change over each, you know, iteration of its existence over yeah. thousands of years. The Stonehenge is an interesting site because, of course, it's always been there in the sense that it, when it was built 5,000 years ago, uh, it's been in the landscape ever since. It's quite different to, say, Tutankhamun's tomb, which was discovered you know, in the 1920s. It lay hidden for thousands of years. Um, Stonehenge has always been there. It's always had an impact. And in a way, there is every generation's spirit, if you like, there in the people who have been there, the people who have seen it, the, the layers, if you like, of memory which have been added to it. Or you could turn it around the other way and say Stonehenge has been standing there watching every generation that's passed through that landscape yeah. since 3000 BC, so 5000 years of continuous people moving through, coming to visit, coming to see it. And in some sense, the monument has soaked up that experience, just as when we go there now, we soak up the experience of the monument. So it's a two way relationship. The antiquity of it gives it its power. Um, but the antiquity only has that power because it's been there all that time. We can absorb that, we can experience that and we can say something about it when we're there. And because it is powerful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, we are just about out of time. Do we have, is there any questions, Harriet, from people listening? Um, I've been really enjoying reading the thread. It's much more of a commentary and um, people agreeing and people putting their own um, take on what, what we've been talking about. So I highly recommend that you have a read of it on, on the Facebook group if, if you have yeah, that. Definitely. Um, no, no, no obvious questions coming up, though. Um, but some wonderful points. So thank you to everybody who's who's made a, a comment. That's been great. So, so yes, I think Trebby. Yeah, so, Harriet, you, know, you go ahead. Well, I my dog's now just saying she, he wants to go out. Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think we'll we'll draw to the conversation to a close at that point. We've it's been an absolute honour to have you explain your relationship to Stonehenge and where it is right now in in how it is I think it's we've all learned so much about what Stonehenge could possibly be right now and I think you're absolutely right that we need that we need to be reminded that our, our sacred sites aren't just you know tourist attractions they're actually places that are trying are bringing back a sense of well-being of wholeness and of uh, belonging so thank mm -hmm. you so much for explaining that to the people in the cafe oh, no, no. sorry we we're a bit interrupted at times with gremlins of the internet <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um and and i think what came through so clearly to echo what Har harriet said is that people go to stonehenge not just because it's historic but because they're hoping for some kind of transformation in themselves so it's, mm. thank you so much i it's been a real pleasure to talk with you great thank you beth Thanks and uh, we now are saying goodbye in, in the earth exchange cafe uh, next month let's see what is the date i believe it's march 15th i believe is it march 15th mm. ides of march ides of march it, it um yes it is the ides of march we are talking to uh, Harriet. How do you pronounce her name? 
Aver? Emer. 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 And, um, and it, it's, oh, that's, that's March. I, I should be talking about February. I'm ahead of myself. And February 22nd, we're talking to Laura Schmidt, who is one of the co-founders with Amy Rao of the Good Grief Network. And then in March, we're going to be starting um, a, a spirit spring. We're going to be talking to a, a chief of the Bar Art order of the bards and druids and a Jewish uh, cleric, a Jewish rabbi, a Christian, and a Native American. And they're all going to talk about their ways of interweaving earth spirituality into their work and they will be doing the opening and closing ceremonies for the cafe as well so tune in and um you can read about this on our website and you can see tim's uh conversation on facebook and also on youtube tomorrow and on our website so we uh, thank you for being with the cafe and uh, now that you've finished your tea and your cocoa, you can hear the chairs kind of scraping back against the floor as people get ready to leave. The musicians have stopped playing. The lights are flickering because it's time to go. And so go safely away from the cafe after this wonderful conversation about this sacred place. And we will see you next month.